Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a fascinating series on the book, The Great Controversy, of course, written by Ellen White. And we're coming down close to the end now. This lesson is entitled Earth's Closing Events. It's the lesson number 12 for June 22 of 2024. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we are so privileged to have had all this material revealed to us, spelled out so that we can study it and think about it and figure out how to prepare ourselves for what is coming. Guide us as we think about that today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. How, how much do we know about the final closing events in this world's history? Are we adequately preparing ourselves for what is coming? Jim? Suppose you had a daughter driving home from college for summer vacation. As you wait for her to arrive, you anxiously monitor the weather reports. You become worried as the weather rapidly deteriorates. Storm clouds loom over the horizon. Winds blow fiercely. The heavens open and rain pours down. Trees are blown over. Soon the main road home is impassable. Then you hear from one of your neighbors that it is, that it is possible to get through on a secondary road. Cars can navigate around some down tree limbs. Although communication is difficult, you are able to get the, a text message to your daughter, carefully detailing how she can get home safely. More than anything else, Jesus wants to take us through the storm of life and get us home. Ellen White writes, a storm is coming, relentless in its fury. We are, are we prepared to meet it? Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, page 315. The purpose of Christ's death, excuse me, life, life death, resurrection, and ministry in heaven, excuse me, in the heaven's sanctuary is to ensure that we get home. The prophetic message of Daniel and Revelation are divine instructions, especially for an end time people to help us through life storms so that one day we can feel the warm embrace of a loving savior from the bible study guide for june okay. 15. okay now we're going to take a little bit of exception to what they said there it's not wrong it's just not nearly adequate uh, we believe that christ's life death resurrection and ministry to save us as stated in the bible study guide uh, is is okay it's not wrong, it's just not adequate. It was to secure the truth about God and to secure the, the, the trust and, and belief of the entire universe. We can't leave that part out. Yes. How, impo how important is the truth to you? How do you determine what is truth? Well, Jesus said that's why he came here 2,000 years ago, to bear witness okay. to the truth. Let's see what we can do. Proverbs 23, Jennifer. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Truth, wisdom, learning, and good sense. These are worth paying for, but too valuable for you to sell. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting, interesting statement. Yeah. Go ahead, the next one. From John 8, verse 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, now here's a quiz question for you real quick. What, what, were, what was the circumstances of Jesus saying that, those verses, John 8, 32? Who was, well, who was Jesus talking to? Hmm. Mm. John 8, starting with verse 12 through verse about 55, I think it is, is Jesus being called before the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. And in that discussion, he says three times, I, I am. And what does that mean in biblical language? I am, God. I am God. I am God. And finally, the third time he said it, before Abraham was born, I am. Hello out there. <laughs> Did you hear me? I said, oh, yeah. Grab a stone and throw at him. So that, that was their response to the verse we just read. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And then John 17, verse 17. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I have to tell you another quick story. There's a 
pastor, a black pastor in the South that was telling the story of Jesus' first visit to Nazareth when he was 12 years old. And of course, he was putting questions to them and they, they were having a hard time answering and they were put, started putting questions back to him. And one of these guys says, how old are you? And he hesitated for a second. He said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I just love that, that comment. Okay. <laughs> we know that Satan is a liar and that he has accused God of being a liar. In that same chapter, John 8, John 8, 44, you are the, you are the sons of your father, the devil who's a liar. Um, Satan has become very successful at deceit and lying. By contrast, God always tells the truth. He refuses to lie. Now, we may not always interpret him correctly, but correctly understood, he never tells a lie. Notice these contrasting views of the devil and of Jesus. And here's our word, that same chapter, that same discussion, John 8, 44. The, Gordon? That you just quoted from, you are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt for a Goodness second, then, Bible. then I'll like to go back to it. Who was he speaking to? The Sanhedrin. And what was their job? They were the, certainly religious leaders and to some extent the political leaders of-, of The Jewish people. Okay, they were supposed to be the experts on religion. And look what he just said to them. You're of your father, the devil. Okay. Then continuing John 14, 6, Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the father except by me. And Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Good News Bible. The truth is going to be particularly important to those who live through the final events of this world's history. Are we able to distinguish between the deceptions of Satan and the truth that's presented in God's Word? Remember what we studied last week? None but those who have fortified their minds through the truths of the Scripture will be able to stand. Okay? Myra? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. We have not depended on made-up stories in making known to you the mighty coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. We were there when he was given honor and glory by the Father, God the Father. When the voice came down on to him from the supreme glory, saying, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming down from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Let me interrupt for just a second. I mean, they were very familiar with Jesus. He looked like a human being, he acted like a human being most of the time. <laughs> But imagine hearing a voice come out of the sky and saying, this is my own dear son with whom I am pleased. Mm. How many people heard that? Well, it happened more than once. And how many understood it? The, on the mountain experience, there were only three of them up there with him, Peter, James, and John. The other time where, when he made a statement similar to that was at his baptism. And how many people heard the sound? We don't know. How many understood it? John. Maybe only John the Baptist. But Peter and maybe James and John might have heard at that time too. Okay. okay. Going on to verse 19. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the, of the morning star shines in your hearts. 
Above, above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself the prophecy of the scriptures. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people, will under, people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. Good news, Bible. Amen. And from the writings of Mrs. White, you want me to go on? Go ahead. Okay. The people of God were directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of the spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining the knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. Mm -hmm. The last great delusion will soon open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. Now, what all is implied by that? That's a scare. That's scary. It, it's, it is very scary, but it does say that unless it, you have the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures. So it means we have to stick as close to that as we possibly can. And understand it correctly. Okay, go also, ahead. Also, none of those who were fortified None, of, none but those. None but, thank you, I knew that wasn't coming out right. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. That's the statement I quoted a little while ago. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than man? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Our are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, page 593. Five, five, that chapter is entitled, The Scriptures, A Safeguard. What do we need to do to prepare ourselves to stand firmly during those final, very troublesome times? Are we prepared to go to jail? Are we prepared to have our lives threatened or even taken? The entire world is going to turn against us. Do not be surprised. No wonder God has told us in the New Testament, Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus or have the faith of Jesus. What well, could means both. Ephesians 4, 13 goes on, and do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come to when God will set you free. Okay, now we're going to go back and talk about what we talked about last week. What does this mark of ownership have to do with the seal of God versus the mark of the beast? God's mark of ownership, what would that be called? That is the seal of God, is it not? Yeah. Sure. So that's what we're talking about. We know that the signal issue at the end will be whom do we worship? That is, whom do we consider, of, what do we consider in lives, as, what or whom, I guess, of most importance. That will be represented by what day of the week upon which, the day of the week upon which we worship, Sabbath or Sunday. Marks shall be placed on God's faithful people and also on the devil's people. The seal of God, that's the Holy Spirit there we read about, on God's people and the mark of the beast on the devil's people. Will we be able to see those marks? No. But God's angels will be able to see them. Revelation tells us that there will be a group symbolically known as the 144,000 who will stand firmly through the final events. And how will they be able to do that? They will have the perfect protection of God. Just, just very briefly, let's look at that. Satan's goal, even though he realizes he's never going to... Of course, what he would really like to do is sit in God's seat and rule the universe. He knows he can't do that. But what he would like to do, now that he's confined to this earth, 
is just get rid of all, either convince all of God's faithful people to start worshiping Him, and then just say to God and His angels, okay, you can have the rest of the universe, we'll just, we'll just take this earth. And of course, what's God going to say? No. I'm going to make this future, this earth, my future home. How's he going to sustain? They talk about sustainability. Yeah. How, how's, he, how's the Satan side going to sustain? Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're all that. Yes. You can't get a commercial without it's been produced sustainably. <laughs> okay, Jim, I think you're next. Revelation 7. Verses 1 and 2. After this, I saw four angels standing at the floor, at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. God called out to a me, called out in he a loud voice, out. or he called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. Good news Bible. Hey. In Revelation 14, 1, Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. With him were 144,000 people who have his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. Okay, and one more. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. The beast forced all the people coming and coming, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hand or on their foreheads. No one, excuse me, to have a mark, excuse me, no one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. It's important, important to notice that the seal of God is placed only on the forehead. Only those who are fully committed and loyal to God will have that seal of God placed on them. The mark of the beast will be placed on the forehead, symbolizing those who are committed to the devil, but it will also be placed on the hands of those who are just going on because it's easier. How can we know for sure that if we have received one or the other of these marks? Well, Revelation 13 tells us the devil's side, and Revelation 14 shows us God's response. So that would be a good place to start, right? Could it really be true that almost the whole world will be worshiping the beast and the devil who stands behind the beast? We raised this, this question last, last week. What could make it possible for almost the whole world to worship the devil? How is that possible? What will include... Will that include not only apostate Christians, but also communists and Muslims and Hindus and people of other religions? He's got the media, the microphone, the megaphones. Well, remember what I said last week. Are we going to be selfish or are we going to be loving? That's really the ultimate question. Satan knows that these final events in the world's history will be either triumph or curtains for him. While he would never admit it, deep down in his heart, he knows that he is going to be defeated. Satan's hope is that God will leave him on this earth to rule over all those who are the, his followers, while the rest of the universe is ruled by God. Of course, we know that ultimately, God will bring his government to this earth and rule from here. Satan will have no chance of being a part of that. Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, creation is the basis of true worship. That's Revelation 4, verse 11. Since God created all things through Jesus Christ, from Ephesians 3, 9, Satan hates the Creator and has attempted, through earthly powers, to change the Sabbath, the memorial of creation. It's Daniel 7, 25. The coming conflict over the law of God focuses on authority. If Satan can eradicate Sabbath worship, he will declare that his authority is greater than God's authority. To accomplish this, Satan will attempt to convince or coerce the entire world to accept a counterfeit Sabbath. Okay, the line is being drawn in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. Nearly 2,500 years ago, Daniel warned us in Daniel 7.25 that the devil would seek to change God's laws. It may seem impossible to someone, some living in the Western world particularly, <laughs> that worship of Satan could permeate the entire world. But we know that this world can change quickly. 
Look what happened with COVID-19. So what will Satan do to threaten those who refuse to accept his mark? Revelation 13, verses 13 through 17. This second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. And it deceived all the people living on the earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. Now, let me ask you a question. I'm sorry, but these things just keep flying up in my mind. Will these miracles that are listed there be recognized as miracles by on TV? Mm -hmm. Will the famous TV personality stand up and say, "Well, we've now come, we've now found another miracle." Well, the people Eventually. are not going to realize they're worshiping the devil. Mm-hmm. And media will play into that. Okay. People will eventually declare them to be miracles. And since what they say is that Satan doesn't exist, these miracles must be from God. Yes. Let's follow God and yeah. do mm -hmm. what these miracles tell us to. Mm-hmm. Okay, you want Dangerous. to continue? Continuing with uh, in verse 14, halfway through, the beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast name or the number of the, that the name stands for the name. Okay. Good News Bible. Satan will not only threaten to kill us, but also he will try to make it impossible for us to buy or sell or conduct business in any way. How could that happen? Well, it's becoming more obvious all the time how it could happen, right? Well, the, just look and see how quick your credit card can be uh, turned down. No? Yep. When there's fraud or something. <clears throat> While Satan is quickly trying to organize the whole world on his side, God is not sleeping. And I might add, um, when people commit, commit a crime and they try to escape maybe with somebody else's credit card, that kind of stuff, Boy, people, they, people know instantly, as soon as that credit card is used in the wrong place, bango. There it goes. As soon as I use a credit card, Myra gets notification of it. Yeah, I do. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Within a couple seconds. Yeah, it's very cool. Wow. I mean, and so does the government. And the bank. Yeah. They all know. Yeah. While Satan is quickly trying to organize the whole world on his side, God is not sleeping. The Holy Spirit will pour out the latter rain. It will be even greater than the former rain at Pentecost. Wow. So while Satan is making great inroads, God will be also making great strides. Okay. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4 and 41 to 47. When the day of Pentecost came and all the believers were gathered together in one place, suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. This would be really amazing yes. to see. Um, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Many of them believed his message and were baptized. This is moving on to uh, verse 41. Um, and about 3,000 people were added to that group that day. They spent their time learning from the apostles, taking part in fellowship and preparing in and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Life Among the Believers in verse 43 says, Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles, and everyone was filled with awe. 
all the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to that which was which each one needed. Day after day, they met as a group in the temple, and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the good will of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. I want you to picture this in your mind. Who was responsible for the temple? In, in, in Jesus' day, who was responsible for the temple? The, the Sadducees. It's primarily the, the priests or the Sadducees. They were, they were from the, some Pharisees as well, but mostly it's the Sadducees. The, sad, the two main beliefs that we know about that the Sadducees held were... There's no resurrection. There's no resurrection, and there's no existence beyond yeah. this life. Okay, no angels, that either. And here are these people proclaiming that Jesus is raised from the dead. They're having a great rejoicing group meeting in the temple every day. I mean, <laughs> I mean what were the Sadducees saying? And look at this, enjoying, these people are enjoying the goodwill of all the people. No. I mean, uh, the Sadducees, I mean, there's nothing. Well, we'll read on. We'll learn more about them in a moment. We know about the marvelous response to Peter's sermon at Pentecost. What events led to these results? It was certainly not just Peter's sermon. Acts 4, verse 4, But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Okay? Acts 6, verse 7, And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, oh dear, Sadducees? accepted the faith. So they weren't all against the faith. We, also, we should note also that many Pharisees became Christians if you go over to Acts 15, 5. So something's going on here. The Holy Spirit's at work, right? We know that the preaching and life of John the Baptist prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah the first time. Malachi 4 suggests that a group of people will prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. Could we be those people? In Malachi, they're called an Elijah. Mm -hmm. So you we, just read what happened at Pentecost, and yep. we're told by Ellen White that it's even, the end time will be even more than at Pentecost. Yes, exactly. We know that persecution came to the disciples and the apostles in a fierce way after the stoning of Stephen. Due to the persecution, the believers were scattered from being just in Jerusalem, and everywhere they went, they carried the gospel. By the way, um, I always want to remember Acts 13. What happened in Acts 13, the last part? The, the, the city that came to be the sort of church headquarters after Jerusalem was in trouble, or the Christians in Jerusalem were in trouble, was Antioch up in Syria. And who was it that came and made, set that church on fire? People from Libya and Cyprus. And what did they do? They came to Antioch and they said, we can't preach just to Jews. We have to preach to Gentiles too, and boom. Yeah. That was before Paul. Heresy. Mm. Yep. Heresy didn't go to anyone but the Jews. Incredible story. How long before Paul? Oh boy, that's hard to say. Uh, it might even have been while well, Paul was out in the desert discovering <laughs> what. Yeah. It wasn't too much before yeah. Paul. Okay. Yeah. It is important for us to remember under those circumstances that it is not our job to spread the gospel. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are just cooperators. Okay, let's be clear about that. And by, by the way, to answer your question, it was that church that placed its, placed its hands on Paul and Silas, 
I, I'm Paul and Barnabas first and said, go and spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Hmm. Okay, Ellen G. White. Jim? As the former rain was given, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the unspringing, upspringing. The, yeah, the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at the close for the ripening of the harvest. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 611. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority, and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen. Great, ba great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For, the, for all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew rich from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not part take part in her sins. You must not share in her punishment. Good News Bible. You want to read? Uh, Jennifer, you can go ahead and take the <coughs> next couple. Sure. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. But the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. Oh, ho. so what needs to happen? The knowledge of the Lord's glory and so forth. Not just his glory, everything about him. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached through all the world for a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Notice that in Revelation 18, the angel has great authority. What is the authority based upon? Matthew 10, 1. Jesus called the 12 disciples together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. So the authority came from Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then Matthew 28, 18, 19, Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all people everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Good okay, and what, at what point in time did that happen? This was early on. Early on with... Well, this, this particular reference was right just before his ascension. No, no, but, this was after the ascension. Okay, after the ascension. This is, but, and he came back, he said, tell Peter and the other disciples that I will come down to meet you in Galilee. This was at the time he came down after the ascension. Yeah. But earlier they had the authority early in the yeah, in the, the Matthew 10 they, was, they went out and raised the dead. And, yeah, that's Matthew 10. That's yeah. clearly earlier. Yeah. yeah. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, that small group of Jesus' disciples managed to spread the gospel to the then known Western world. Mm -hmm. Myra? Yes, from Ellen G. White. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less magnum manifestation of the power of God then marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall, be, shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus, Acts 3, 19 and 20. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from, I'm sorry, this is, this is a continuation of Ellen White right there. I thought that was one from me. Anyway, by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from, the, from heaven in the sight of men. Revelation 13, 13. 
Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. And you know, you wonder about how is the gospel going to be taken to Sikkim or Bhutan or some of those kind of places, you know? How's it going to go to communist China? Yeah. How's it going to go to Russia? Yeah. It's not for us. Not for us to worry about? No. Always It'll go. It'll, yeah. I it, mean, it says here that Satan brings down the fire from heaven, but yet he couldn't do it when Elijah... He did it. Well, not, not he, on Mount no. Carmel. He, Satan didn't do it on Mount Carmel. Well, how about a little later? He wasn't in the earthquake, wind, and the fire. The fire came yeah, down. Yeah. So yeah, but that was not on Mount Carmel. That was, that was yeah. in Mount Sinai. So I, I'm just saying there's one time when God allowed it to happen and one yeah. time. Well, that's, that's the I, difference. I, 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 don't, I do not disagree with you yeah. there. Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, anyway, wow. The publications, the seed has been sown and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now, the rays of light penetrate everywhere. What's going to happen? This is, this is obviously the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It has to be. The truth is seen in his clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Great Controversy 611 and 612. So how large is that number? For people who have been born and raised in the United States, it might seem very difficult to realize that the rights guaranteed in the First Amendment can be set aside and that Protestant groups will eventually be able to force the United States government to enforce their beliefs and their ideas. As early as 1851, Adventists recognized that the second beast of Revelation 13 must refer to the United States of America. Today, the United States is arguably the most powerful nation in the world. Notice these comments about how it will play out. Where are we? Okay. Jim? Okay. <clears throat> All who refuse compliance in observing the false Sabbath will be visited with civil penalties. It will, be fi it will finally be deceived, excuse me, declared that they are deserving of death. On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens with wrath against all those who transgress his precept. Great Controversy, page 604. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. That's scary. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, miss popular. The, easy popular. Choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and power to deceive and mislead souls. Pleasing. They, Pleasing. Talent and pleasing and What's that now? Men of po talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth and po employ their powers to deceive them and mislead souls. Sorry. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the they, courts. They become the most bitter enemies of their of former their brethren. brethren. sure. Okay, then when Sabbath Then when the Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to rip misrepresent and accuse them and are by false reports and insinuations in their in, to, excuse, insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Ellen White, wow. Great Controversy, page 608, mm -hmm. paragraph 2. There are several very important points for, for us to remember in these final events. One, the Bible, the Word of God, is the only infallible guide. Now, if you haven't understood all the details of the Bible, if you haven't studied it carefully, it might seem like just a collection of a bunch of stories. 
but the, 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 the truths are there and they can be dug out. Two, Sabbath keeping will be the sign of our commitment to our Creator and Savior. Now, it's the sign, it's not the whole story. This means that we believe in creation. We believe that God is the one who created. We believe he's the one who sustains us and he restores us and he redeems us. And three, we are never going to be left alone. It might seem like we will be left alone. However, the Holy Spirit will always be with us. We couldn't take another breath or have another heartbeat if he weren't. And while things may seem terrible, the latter rain will be poured out. I mean, it's... Imagine our world, and here's God trying to do his final thing, and Satan trying to do his final thing at the same time. Wow. Notice this story from the Bible study guide of God helping his children. Now, this is quite a story, so maybe we'll read, go around, and each person can read their fairly long paragraphs. Let's see, Jennifer, it's yours. You can start the first paragraph there. Okay, um, from the Bible study guide. Be faithful. God will have the last word. Ian was born and raised in a faithful Adventist family in the Soviet Union. Though his family was poor and was forced to work hard, he had a carefree and happy childhood and youth. At the age of 18, Ian was drafted to serve in the Soviet Army. With other conscripts, he boarded a train and seven days later found himself 1,865 miles, which is approximately 3,000 kilometers away from home. Wow. Thus, his long two-year military term started. Apart from feeling lonely and homesick, Ian knew his biggest challenge was yet ahead. Even before being drafted, he had decided in his heart that he would remain loyal to God and keep the Sabbath, irrespective of what might happen to him. The first couple of Sabbaths, he explained to his immediate super superiors that he could not work on the Sabbath because of his religious convictions. The commanders tolerated him for those first few Saturdays, thinking that he would soon give up his strange, quote, provincial and, quote, primitive customs. Soon, however, Ian's commanders realized the young man was serious. <laughs> wow, and, he and was serious. Took, <laughs> and they took decisive, disciplinary, and, quote, educational measures. One Friday afternoon, after an exhausting workday, they told Ian he did not deserve to sleep on a comfortable bed on the weekend if he refused to work Sabbaths. Instead, they informed him he would spend the weekend in the temporary detention center in the jail. When Ian and his commanders reached the jail, the officers discovered the jail was locked and the warden had gone somewhere else. Can't lock him up because he's locked out. <laughs> As they waited for the warden to return, the officers chatted while Ian watched the sunset and the beautiful Lake Balkesh. Silently, Ian sought reassurance and support from God. Suddenly, a sergeant who had been passing by stopped and casually asked Ian's superiors who they brought to jail. Mm -hmm. oh, excellent. Myra? A Sabbath keeper, they replied. We want to re-educate him to obey orders and to work on Saturdays. Take the next sentence there as well. Yeah. Never explained the sergeant. I know these people. They would rather die than work on Sabbaths. <laughs> the officers realized that they made a big mistake by allowing the sergeant to speak in Ian's hearing. But it was too late. Ian received his much-needed dose of encouragement. Um. Jim? The warden? Oh, the warden. Okay, down at the bottom there. The warden arrived, and just as the Sabbath commenced, he escorted Ian to the jail, a 6.5 by 10 foot, that is a two by three meter room, packed with more than two than 10 other soldiers. Imagine most that. of, wow, most of them were smoking. Mm. The heavy d metal door closed and Ian occupied the only available spot by the entrance, prepared to stand or sit the, the rest of the e weekend. The young soldier of Christ was determined to remain faithful to God's Sabbath. Minutes became hours, and by midnight, Ian began to imagine how the brethren back in his hometown were happily walking to church, excuse me, walking to church to worship God during the Vespers while he remained locked in the jail, dark jail cell filled with cigarette smoke with two more days to go. Suddenly, Ian remembered the last sermon he heard 
and his church before leaving for the military service. It was about the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel and how he prayed seven times for rain. What if I pray seven times? Thought even Ian to himself. The thoughts, it, though it seemed a, almost a presumption, Ian decided to give it a try. He uttered the first simple prayer in his heart. Nothing happened. His second prayer followed. Still no cloud. <laughs> Third prayer, then fourth, then fifth, and sixth. Then finally he uttered his heart, the seventh prayer. Today, excuse oh. me, total midnight silence reigned after his, he finished. The silence did nothing to change Ian's resolve or faith. He was ready to be loyal to God, even if God did not answer his prayers in any apparent way. At least, he thought to himself, I tried, right? Okay, Jennifer. <laughs> However, just a minute later, the silence was broken by footsteps outside the jail. The steps were followed by clinking keys, then by the squeaking of the door as it was opened. The warden appeared in the doorway and searched the room with his flashlight. When the warden spotted Ian, he commanded him to step outside. <laughs> Once outside, the supervisor took Ian to his office, improvised a simple but comfortable bed, and invited the youth to sleep. Can you imagine? <laughs> Amazing. Ian collapsed and was asleep in a moment. In the morning, Ian awoke to another surprise. The supervisor brought him breakfast. Even more, the I mean, warden... These are communist soldiers, okay? Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry. Even more, the warden gave Ian a bundle with food and conducted him to the shore of the lake where he set him free to enjoy the Sabbath in nature. Gordon? Ian spent the following several Sabbaths in the same way. The officers would bring him to the jail for the weekends. The warden would free Ian and feed him for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> then on Monday morning, Ian would return to his barracks. The following months and years were replete with many other similar experiences of God's miraculous interventions on his behalf. After two years, Ian returned home, a mature, strong young man, faithful to God. Yes, he went against the behemoth of the Soviet army, which had sought to crush his faith. Yes, his officers had told him he was not worthy to sleep on the army's mattresses, but God had the last word. God cares for his faithful people who make the decision, as Daniel did in the Bible, and as Ian did, to remain loyal to him. Okay, so the now. Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this for a moment. Is this kind of thing going to happen even in all the countries of the world, even here? It will happen to some, but not to all. Well, I didn't, I, I, probably to some. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, if we believe what the Bible says, some will even be killed. Yeah. That's, we remember the story of Peter being broken out of the jail. Mm -hmm. He was chained between two, guards, two guards, supposed to be executed in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he walked through the gates mm -hmm. free. You think God could help somebody pre escape from high security prison in the United States? Could happen. I mean, I'm just trying to get us to think outside the box a little bit here. Yeah. Well, the question which we need to talk about in the last few minutes we have here, where does loyalty come from? Trusting and belief in another person. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. The question is, where does it come from? Bible study mm -hmm. guide says. You can well, you, uh, you start reading it and we'll, we'll interrupt and talk about it as we go along here. Loyalty has, its, has always fascinated the students of human nature and history. As a behavioral attitude, loyalty has its basis in various things. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Let's, let's think along as we go. What things make you, what, what things do you think contribute to your loyalty? Who are you loyal to and why? Hopefully you're loyal. What about family? Yeah. 
you're loyal to your family. Why? Because you've gotten very familiar with them, they've supported you, you've supported them in some cases, your children, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, they're a part of you, right? Okay, go ahead. Um, some of these bases are biological or predetermined. Okay, such family, as for example. One's family or the place of one's birth. Personal decisions form another basis for loyalty. Yeah. I stop for a second here because I think loyalty is a, a part of um, one's personality. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are just more loyal to family, uh, their baseball team. They're, you know, they're just very loyal where others are. Do you think that has something to do with the environment in which they grow up? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Some people are loyal to their gang. Yeah. That's yeah. Very true. And some very famous criminals in the past have had their mothers train them to, 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 to commit crimes, and they're loyal to mom. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Going on. Personal decisions form a basis for loyalty. These decisions may be related to various things, such as monetary benefits, payment rewards, convictions, or worldviews, or morality. Some people base their loyalty on duty, others on preference, still others on utility. Okay, what would utility mean? What's convenient. Yeah. Yeah, what works, right? Yeah. What, what works, okay. The objects of loyalty are related to these bases. People show their devotion to their families, tribes, nations, religions, ideologies, philosophies, nature, and businesses to name just a few allegiances. But what is Christian loyalty? Okay, where did that come from? Where does Christian loyalty come from? Because that's really our point, right? Mm -hmm. Does it just descend from the sky? Hopefully it's based on our knowledge and experience with, yeah. with God. Okay, and, and the Bible. This Think, is, uh, uh, yeah. Christian loyalty is not religion loyalty. No. And I think... Okay, and I, uh, I have had an opportunity to dissociate with, to associate with some young people recently that are, um, you know, not really Christian. They're not, yeah. they're nice young people, but um, not Seventh-day Adventists for sure. And I just have struggled in my mind, okay, what would I say to them from the Bible that might convince them to become an Adventist? What could you say? What would you, what would you pick out from the Bible that might get their attention? It's not supposed to be an impossible question. Search for truth. What, what is the truth about God? What is the truth that sets people free? What, yeah. Those who the fear of death are in lifelong bondage. bondage okay. e, uh, Hebrews 2.15. Uh, these Jews don't, don't have that fear of lifelong bondage. They don't think of that as... I mean, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm talking about people who are in the world. You know, I'm not talking I about know. not people who have a Christian background. I, I think that probably... <laughs> When, when Isaiah was trying to deal with that issue, he came up with, okay, God created, and there's, we've looked, looked at before it, at James Tour, professor down in Texas, who has demonstrated it is impossible from a human standpoint for anything to be created. Well, okay, what other option does that give you? And what about the God's ability to predict the future far in advance? Okay, what kind of power is that? I mean, those are the kind of things I think you could say to a young person, you know, something, something's going on here. What is that, is that a text in, is it Second Peter? Uh, like those who are like wild beasts are caught 
but they, they have no, they're, they're just that way. They, they don't have any hooks to hook, yeah. uh, uh, communicate truth to. Think of the story of Job to answer the last question in the Bible study guide we're just talking about. Job 1, 8 through 12. Did you notice my servant Job, the Lord asked? There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. Uh, he worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. Careful not to do anything evil. Mm -hmm. Satan replied, wouldn't Job, would Job worship you if he got nothing out of you, out of it? You've always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does and you have given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. <laughs> But now suppose you take away everything he has. He will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord said to Satan, everything he has is in your power, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. Okay. Job became a faithful friend of God at a time when there was no Bible, no church, no Sabbath school, not even a pastor or a prophet to give guidance. Despite all the evils that Satan could throw at him, Job remained faithful. God's judgment or evaluation of Job proved to be correct, and Satan was resoundingly defeated. A group of people living at the end of this world's history will have to repeat Job's experience. They will be the 144,000. Are we ready? <laughs> Don't everybody jump up and volunteer. <laughs> okay, things may look very bad, but we can rely upon God. Okay. Jim, I think that's yours. Back at three, verses 17 and 18. Even if the fig tree does not blossom, there is no fruit on the vines. If the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation from now, the New Standard Bible. Those who live, of us who live in this environment, they may, we may not have a hard time understanding that, but if you're a subsistence farmer, the only thing you have to eat is what you grow or what your animals produce. That's a pretty you terrible situation, that. right? Okay, Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, Ian's story recounted above is truly an amazing and encouraging one, but we also know that for every account like that, there are many others whose faithfulness brought calamity and suffering upon them and perhaps their loved ones. How do we understand stories like that? Okay, we have to stop there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, stories and stories and the events of the Bible and these warnings and guidance we've been given in these lessons has been very, very helpful. May we take these ideas home with us. May all who listen in take them home with them and remember how, may we learn how we can better represent you so that the time may come soon when you can return is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.